Ovo je Al Jazeera Svijet, a ja sam Azra Hadžić. Priče koje vas očekuju u nastavku. Rat narativa Izraela i Hezbolaha. Kako se u tom sukobu koristi propaganda? Šta stoji na putu dvodržavnom rješenju Izraelsko-Palestinskog sukoba? 20 godina od smrti Jasera Arafata, simbola palestinskog otpora i borbe za neovisnost. I Izrael i Hezbollah se međusobno optužuju za širenje propagande i davanje lažnih informacija medijima. Pristup mjestu izraelskih napada u Libanu često ovisi o naoružanoj skupini koja ih prati do mjesta događaja. Tvrde novinari, a kako prenosi naš reporter Charles Stratford iz Bejruta, Mnogi medijski radnici žale se da Hezbollah ne dijeli dovoljne informacija sa onima koji pokušavaju pokriti ratna dešavanja u toj zemlji. Ovo je video Hezbollaha koji je grupa objavila nakon atentata na svog vođu Hasana Nasralaha krajem septembra. Demonstracija snage nakon velikog udarca. Balistički projektili skriveni pod zemljom. Teško naoružani borci u tunelima. Snažna, ali veoma stilizirana poruka. Kao što je slučaj u svakom ratu, propaganda se koristi i na obje strane. Hezbollah je kritikovan jer ne pruža dovoljno informacija i negira gubitke koje je pretrpio zbog izraelskih napada u Libanu, što je njihov glasnogovornik, prije nego je ubijen u izraelskom napadu, jasno demantoval. Izraelska vojska objavila je ovaj video za koji kaže da prikazuje izraelske vojnike kako ulaze u sela u Južnom Libanu. Ponovo snažna poruka, ali ograničenja za medije od izraelske strane znači da je dobijanje jasne slike o tome šta se događa na bojnom polju u Južnom Libanu gotovo nemoguće. As journalists, we have to time when we come to strike sites like this on the outskirts of Dahia to report. That's not only because of the forced evacuation orders issued by the Israeli military and the risk, it's also because we try and minimize the time here to avoid harassment. There is deep, deep distrust of the media. For most journalists, trying to report inside Dahia at the level of destruction is very difficult because of the restrictions imposed by Hezbollah. Hezbollah do duše nudi ture medijskim timovima, ali one su strogo kontrolisane i mnogi novinari se žale na nedostatak informacija koje Hezbollah dijeli. Grupa je prestala službeno objavljivati broj smrtnih slučajeva svojih boraca nakon napada koji je uključivao eksplozivne pejđere 17. septembra, a koji su ciljali mnoge članove Hezbolaha i neke visoke zapovjednike. Obje strane jedna drugu optužuju za laž i izvrtanje činjenica. Jedna stvar koju je lakše potvrditi unutar Libana su stotine hiljada ljudi kojima su domovi i poslovi uništeni. Brojni poginuli i povrijeđeni, uključujući stotine žena i djeci. O propagandi i ratu narativa Hezbolaha i Izraela za Al Jazeera je govorio Mark Owen Jones, profesor medijske analitike sa Univerziteta Northwestern u Kataru. False information, propaganda, it depends exactly how you want to distinguish these two things. But of course, I mean, certainly Hezbollah will be not wanting to reveal the extent or the impact of Israel's attacks on Lebanon because this would be demoralizing. And we know that Israel's strategy is also to exaggerate their successes. Their aim is to basically attack not just Hezbollah, but to put pressure on a Hezbollah by decimating infrastructure in order that people turn against Hezbollah. So you have these two situations where Hezbollah do not want the extent of Israel's damage to be to be seen by everyone. At the same time, you want to have Israel wanting to maximize and emphasize the amount of, of, of damage caused in Lebanon in order to put pressure on Hezbollah. So this will obviously lead to a war on narratives, one in which you will see these dueling forms of propaganda. And social media uh, is enables people to post content and have that content spread. But at the same time, it's very easy to cast doubt on what people write on social media. Just because someone sees something on social media, it doesn't necessarily mean they will believe it. Often, what we believe 
is conditioned by what we want to believe or what we already believe. This is called confirmation bias. At the same time, depending on the context, uh, people might be afraid to post on social media because if they do, there will be fear of consequences. They might film, for example, a bomb site, and they might uh, there might be consequences. They might be threatened or told to delete it because someone, whether it's Hezbollah or the IDF, don't want them to show that. And we know, for example, the IDF have been targeting journalists for months now. And so we know that journalists themselves, or whether they're using their social media or uh, you know more sophisticated equipment, know that they might be killed simply for reportage. And the same applies to civilians, right? We know that media are the witnesses and the, the witnesses to these atrocities happening in the Levant. And, and whether you're a civilian or a journalist, the consequences for posting might be death. These two parties, Israel and Hezbollah, are, are in, have different objectives. Hezbollah is engaged in existential quest for survival. Um, the fact is, why putting out false information is simply going to undermine the public trust in it as an institution, which has already been eroded, right? I think people underestimate the importance of that felicity to truth in these kind of con in these kind of conflicts, right? If you seem to be a dishonest broker, then people won't necessarily think you are a legitimate actor, right? Um, and also, it just makes it hard to know what's going on. And if that's the case, it means people aren't making uh, decisions that necessarily will be in their best interest because they are making decisions and choices about what's going on based on information that might not be accurate. So it's really deceiving uh, the people at large and the population, not giving them the full facts, the full picture that they are entitled to, uh, and by doing so, undermining the, the, the kind of integrity of those institutions. Dolaskom Donalda Trumpa na vlast, mnogi se pitaju kakav će biti njegov plan za Bliski istok. Desetljećima su svjetski čelnici govorili da je rješenje izraelsko-palestinskog sukoba jednostavno. Dvije države, Izrael i Palestina, jedna pored druge. Ali šta stoji na putu takvom rješenju? Pojašnjeno u priči Al Jazeera Plus. I've been to the occupied Palestinian territories and reported from there for years. I've spent a lot of time filming stories and documentaries about life under Israeli military occupation in the places that are supposed to make up a future Palestinian state. Palestinians are a people. There's a Palestinian flag. Palestine is represented at the United Nations. But for now, there's no actual Palestinian state. And I think the chance of there being one as part of a two-state solution that divides this land between Israelis and Palestinians, well, I don't think that's very likely, and I'm going to tell you why. More than 140 countries recognize Palestine as a state. Norway recognizes the state of Palestine. The path to peace goes through a two-state solution. We have recognized both the state of Israel and the state of Palestine. This is where many people expect this state to eventually exist. More than five and a half million Palestinians live in these territories, many of them refugees expelled from their homes by Israel. Remember that because it's an important part of the story and we'll get to it later. But for now, I want you to pay attention to these. You know, one thing that stands out to me every time I travel between Palestinian towns in the West Bank is how many Israeli settlements there are. There everywhere. You can see these white stone-walled buildings and red-tiled roofs all over the occupied West Bank. And under international law, they are all illegal because this is not Israeli land, but the people who live in these areas are Israeli settlers. In fact, about one in every 10 Israeli Jews lives in one of these settlements. They include high-ranking government officials, military commanders, and Israeli Supreme Court justices. The Israeli government subsidizes their lifestyle with cheaper housing and tax breaks. These settlements are built on land confiscated by force from Palestinians. Stolen is another word for it. And the settlements are built between Palestinian towns and villages, cutting people off from each other and from their own natural resources. The infrastructure of these Israeli settlements, security zones, settler roads, and military bases, have made it impossible to create a contiguous Palestinian state here. If you're asking me, is a Palestinian state viable with all these settlements uh, spread out throughout the West Bank? No, it's impossible. It's impossible to have a state. This, that's the reference to the Swiss cheese with holes. If the West Bank was going to become part of a Palestinian state, then these holes would have to be filled in by absorbing the settlements into this future Palestine. Either the Israeli settlers would come under Palestinian rule or they'd have to be removed. 
It's hard to imagine Israel forcing hundreds of thousands of its citizens out of the settlement it spent decades building for them. In fact, Israel has said that it wants to annex those settlements and keep them for itself. The settlements are the most obvious reasons why Palestinian statehood in the West Bank remains highly unlikely. It's a reason you can see and feel. It's a reason that's literally made of concrete. But there are also a lot of political reasons. Let's go back a few decades. The closest we've ever been to a two-state solution was the 1993 Oslo Accords, a deal signed by the Palestine Liberation Organization and Israel. The PLO had given up its claims to historic Palestine and hoped the Oslo Accords would lead to a Palestinian state in just the West Bank and Gaza. As part of the Accords, the PLO recognized Israel. Israel did not recognize a Palestinian state in return. The Israeli Prime Minister at the time was the Labour Party's Yitzhak Rabin. The Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin has been shot. A Jewish gunman attacked him tonight at a peace rally in Tel Aviv. Rabin's assassin accused him of giving up too much to the Palestinians. But Rabin had never intended to accept full Palestinian independence. He said the most Palestinians would ever get was an entity less than a state. And this has always been the most that any Israeli government has been willing to consider. For example, Rabin was seen as a liberal. But Israel's longest serving prime minister, the conservative right wing Benjamin Netanyahu, has said that the most he'd allow Palestinians to have is a state minus. And as we were recording this, the Israeli parliament voted to reject the creation of a Palestinian state. So the rejection of a fully independent Palestinian state is mainstream in Israeli politics. In contrast, even Hamas, the other major Palestinian movement, has said that if a real Palestinian state were to be founded in the West Bank and Gaza, it would accept that. Obviously, the Oslo Accords did not lead to an independent Palestinian state, and there haven't been serious negotiations for a resolution since early 2001. But one thing every Israeli government has done, even when there were negotiations, was to build more settlements. Here's Israeli historian Avi Schleim describing that strategy. He's like a man who pretends to negotiate over the division of a pizza and he keeps eating it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I promise that was the last food analogy in this video, but this whole idea of cutting up the land and dividing it is not new. It's actually a pretty old one. So old that there's an argument that partition, trying to create two states on this land, is the cause of this conflict. Let me explain. In 1917, the British Empire occupied Palestine and promised to establish a Jewish homeland there. Now, that was a problem because Palestine was not empty, and only 6% of its population was Jewish. So over the next 30 years, Britain tried to change those demographics. It encouraged the immigration of European Jews to Palestine and helped them build the infrastructure of a state. Today, the refugee from Germany finds 350,000 Jews in Palestine finds himself one of 50,000 a year pouring in from all over the world. No more than 50,000 because that is the quota Britain has set. At the same time, it brutally repressed Palestinian resistance to British occupation and put down any attempt by Palestinians to build a state of their own. And Britain created multiple commissions and reports like this one to answer the question of how to turn Palestine into a Jewish state. The answer often came back as partition, dividing the land into two countries, one Arab and one Jewish. The two-state solution. But because Palestinians were the majority, this meant that hundreds of thousands of them would have to be expelled to create a state with a sustainable Jewish majority. By the end of World War II, an exhausted Britain was retreating from its global empire and gave up sorting out the problem it had created in Palestine. The Union Jack was hauled down and the doors closed for good on the British mandate. It punted the question to the newly created United Nations, which in 1947 voted to partition Palestine and to give 55% of the land to the Jewish state, even though Jews were still a minority. The UN plan didn't explain how this state would be Jewish when, even in that territory, Jews weren't a clear majority. So the leaders of what would become Israel began changing those demographics by force. They began expelling the Palestinian population, eventually emptying more than 450 cities, towns, and villages. Israel declared itself a state in May 1948 and defeated a feeble, unorganized military intervention by several poorly equipped Arab armies. By the time the fighting stopped, Israel controlled not just 55%, but 78% of the land. 
Most importantly, it had driven out 750,000 Palestinians, three quarters of the population, and has never allowed them to return. Palestinians call this the Nakba, the Arabic word for catastrophe. And in 1967, Israel went on to occupy the rest of what had been Palestine. Since then, attempts at creating a two-state solution have focused on reversing what happened in 1967. They ignore what happened to the Palestinians in 1948, when they were displaced and made stateless. Today, there are around 6 million Palestinian refugees, those who were kicked out by Israel and their descendants. If partition was to finally succeed and we end up with two states, where would they go? You might assume they'd all go to the new state of Palestine, but under international law, refugees have the right to return to where their homes were, which would be inside Israel today. So here we are again, trying to square this circle. To become a Jewish state, Israel forced out most of the non-Jews. Letting them back in, which Israel is obligated to do under UN Resolution 194 adopted in 1948, would make Jews a minority again. You know, the refugee issue isn't a minor problem. For Palestinians, the right to return is at the center of their struggle and identity. But even if we were to ignore that and just focus on creating a Palestinian state on the ground, we have to deal with the fact that neither Israel nor its main backer, the United States, really accept the idea of Palestinians having full sovereignty. They insist that a Palestinian state can't have its own military, for example. It's hard to imagine Palestinians accepting that, especially considering what happened during the Nakba or Israel's current destruction of Gaza. Still, let's assume that all those issues were resolved or put to the side. In that scenario, Palestinians would accept a state on 22% of their homeland, that's the West Bank and Gaza. They'd agree to Israel annexing the settlements it has built on that land. Millions of Palestinian refugees would give up their right to return to their homes. Palestine would be made up of disconnected territories, and it would have less sovereignty than any other country on earth. What would a two-state solution mean for Israel? Because Israel's own laws define the country as a place where the right to self-determination is reserved for Jewish Israelis only. As Benjamin Netanyahu once said, Israel is the national state not of all its citizens, but only of the Jewish people. That's a problem when about 20% of your population isn't Jewish. These are Israel's Palestinian citizens, the ones who managed to stay behind during the Nakba. If a separate Palestinian state is established and Israel remains a Jewish state, what would happen to them? Some Israeli officials have been explicit about wanting to expel them to any future Palestinian state, although most Israeli politicians refuse the idea of that state ever existing. So we keep coming back to the same point. Every attempt to partition the land and separate Israeli Jews and Palestinians ends in either population expulsion or a system where people have different rights based on the community they were born into. So to recap, Israel's illegal settlements and land grabs have pretty much made the founding of a Palestinian state impossible. But even if that wasn't the case, just creating a Palestinian state doesn't fix the core issue of this conflict, the forced expulsion of most of the Palestinian population. It also doesn't address the discrimination facing Israel's non-Jewish citizens. The two-state solution doesn't solve any of these problems. What the two-state solution does is try to preserve a Jewish majority state that was only created by forcing the Palestinians out. And to be honest, all of this is based on hopes from decades ago. It doesn't reflect the reality of today, where Israel has destroyed Gaza and effectively annexed the West Bank already. The Israeli human rights group Beit Selim, like many other human rights groups, describes that reality as apartheid, a system of Jewish supremacy between the river and the sea. Maybe the solution isn't to find new ways to separate the people on this land by ethnic division, but to strive for equality among all. So all those officials from around the world that talk about a two-state solution, perhaps they should also drive around the occupied West Bank, understand the reality, and then figure out what they'll do to change it. 11. November 2004, godine, preminuje palestinski predsjednik Yasser Arafat. Bez obzira na to što su ga neke palestinske grupe kritizirale, ipak mnogi smatraju da je on bio i ostao najvažniji simbol palestinskog otpora i borbe za neovisnost. U Ramalahu je muzej koji nosi njegovo ime i u kojem se posjetioci mogu upoznati sa dijelovima savremene palestinske historije. Muzejske zbirke i postavke obuhvataju stotine fotografija, murala, arhivska dokumenta i digitalnu bazu muzejske građe. Posjetili smo tu palestinsku kulturno-obrazovnu instituciju 
i zabilježili priča onih koji su pratili Arafata u presudnim trenucima historije palestinskog naroda. محمد حلايكا مدير متحف ياسر عرفات احنا الان في متحف ياسر عرفات متحف الذاكره الفلسطينيه المعاصره بيقدم الروايه الفلسطينيه خلال المئة سنه الماضيه زائد سيره ابو عمار طبعا ابو عمار ليس مفروضا على الروايه الفلسطينيه ولا تقدم الروايه الفلسطينيه بدون ابو عمار خصوصا انه هو الفصل الاطول في مسيره الحركه الوطنيه الفلسطينيه خلال ال50 سنه اللي الماضيه متحف ياسر عرفات يعرض اهم المحطات اللي 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 مر فيها القضيه الفلسطينيه واهم المحطات اللي في حياه ياسر عرفات خلال الفتره اللي تمتد من بدايه القرن ال20 الى 2004 السنه التي استشهد فيها نعرض الصور والفيديو والمقتنيات وجميعها بما يختم تقديم رواية متكاملة موثقة للحركة الوطنية الفلسطينية وعشان هيك قضية المتحف هناك التداخل ما بين حياة أبو عمار اللي ما عنده حياة شخصية أبدا وما بين تطور الأحداث اللي مرت فيها القضية الفلسطينية الشهيد أبوي كان مرافق الشهيد أبو عمار طبعا وكنت أنا أكون مع أبوي في مراحل أنا صغيرة يعني من عمر تسع سنين كنت أتواجد مع أبوي دائما يعني عند الأخ أبو عمار وتعرفت على الأخ أبو عمار وأنا عمري تسع سنين أو يمكن أقل شوي هاي الصورة لما صارت غارة حمام الشط في الخمسة وثمانين هو استشهد والدي فيها حمام الشط في تونس طبعا بعد هاي الصورة الأخ أبو عمار تبناني أنا وأخوتي وربينا أغلب الوقت عند أبو عمار الله يرحمه طبعا هون اول ما دخلنا على فلسطين بال 94 هاي هون انا على ظهر السياره هلا بيجي فيديو هاي انا هون هون اول ما دخلنا على فلسطين دخلنا مع الاخ ابو عمار وتوجهنا اول ما دخل على المعبر على رفح هون اول ما دخل ركع سجد ركعتين لله وشكر ربه انه دخل الوطن وبنشوف هون هينا هون انا رفعت من هيني بالجهه هون شايف ابو البر الاحمر وضلينا مغادرين من هون لمجلس التشريعي طبعا طول الطريق من ساعه ما طلعنا لعد ما وصلنا مجلس التشريعي حوالي 45 كيلو عرفتي كيف الناس على الشوارع المتحف اللي احنا فيه هو يتكون من قسمين القسم الاول هو المبنى الحديث اللي احنا فيه واللي بتقدم من خلال تقدم من خلال الروايه الفلسطينيه و الجزء الثاني هو المنطقة الحصار المنطقة التي حسر فيها أبو عمار واللي استمر حصارها حوالي 34 شهر متواصلة هناك تركت الأمور كما كانت بمعنى لم يجري أي تغيير على الوضع اللي كان أثناء حياة أبو عمار في هذا القسم الاخ ابو عمار يعني هذا كان الغرفه الابد الحصار هاي كان الطابق الفوقاني كان لطيف كثير مع الصحفي اي صحفي كان نادي عليه كان يحبوا الاخ ابو عمار عمره ما زعل حدا بس ولكن في قضايا الاخ ابو عمار اذا بحس الصحفي طلع عن الخط ممكن صيع عليه هاي الصوره الساعه 3:30 الصبح صورتها لابو عمار في اول ما قصفوا غرفه الاستقبال هاي اللي بالمقاطعه اول مره قصفوها بنتذكر أنا اسمي جمال عروري مصور صحفي يعني أنا بشتغل بهي المهنة منذ 32 سنة من حسن حظي إني أنا يعني عايشت فترة دخول الرئيس الراحل أبو عمار لرام الله من أول لحظة لحد استشهاده كل صحفي كان يحس إنه المادة اللي بده ياخذها الصورة اللي بده ياخذها كان أبو عمار يعطيها بشكل شخصي أبو عمار كان إذا بتنظري له من من الجهة اليسرى كان بكون بعبر بتعبيره عن شخص معين إذا تنظر من الأمام كان يعبر بطريقة معينة، إذا تنظر من اليسار كان يعبر بطريقة معينة، فكل صحفي أو مصور كان يستطيع أن يأخذ ما يريد من هذا الشخص، من هذا الإنسان اللي كان هو يدرك ما مدى وما قدرة الإعلام في التأثير في العالم وقديش كان يدرك قديش ممكن الصحفي يعني يكون سفير للقضية وللموقف السياسي ولأي جانب من جوانب الحياة الفلسطينية.
انا حاصلت هاي المرحله في فتره الحصار ثاني يوم من الحصار دخلت هون وكان هذا الحاجز اللي انكسر يعني بشكل كبير بالنسبه لي احنا هلا موجودين في احد اجنحه اللي كان يتواجد فيها ابو عمار مباشره هذا مكان حرس مبيت الحرس المقربين دائرة المقربه من ابو عمار اللي كان يكونوا مرافقينه 24 ساعه يتناوبوا على حراسته طوال اليوم عمار هو ليس صورة ولا مسدس ولا حطة هي موجودة في هذا المتحف أبو عمار قضية وجود المتحف ووجود الوثائق هاي هي فعلا نبش في الذاكرة من أجل إطلاع الأجيال هاي اللي, اللي لم تعاصر هاي الفترات يعني إحنا شفنا بالمتحف فترات لم ما عاصرناها وقديش عرفنا عن تاريخ هاي المرحلة قديش مهمة فهي الوثائق هاي وهذا المتحف هو يعتبر يعني مش هو مبنى ولكن هو قضية الإنسان سواء الفلسطيني أو أي سائح أو أي زائر لفلسطين بيقدر يتعرف عن القضية الفلسطينية من خلال هذا المتحف فأنا هذا المتحف بعتبره هو يعني عنوان الأهم في والأبرز في فلسطين Ovom pričom završavamo emisiju. Pratite nas na web stranici te YouTube kanalu. Doviđenja.